Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary concepts and more to help you become a literary expert. In today's video we are looking at Ophelia in Hamlet. So Ophelia is the young beautiful daughter of Polonius who is the chief counsellor to King Claudius. She is a sister to Laetes, Hamlet's nemesis, as well as the love interest and supposed bride-to-be of Hamlet, who is of course the Danish prince and protagonist of the play. When people think of Ophelia, the image that immediately comes to mind is probably either of her drowning in a bed of flowers or of her singing like a mad woman while throwing flowers at people around her. And so this point and moment of Ophelia's drowning has been a favourite cultural subject of pre-Raphaelite painters like John Everett Millet and Frederick Heiser, whose romanticised renditions of the character's tragic final moments have really strengthened Ophelia's fascination amongst cultural vultures throughout the ages. So the standard reading of Ophelia is a sympathetic one, perhaps best captured in her famous exclamation, oh, woe is me, in Act 3, Scene 4. And indeed, she does seem like a hapless victim for most of the play, being on the receiving end of her father and brother's paternalistic often patronising warnings against Hamlet's affections, and later, of course, of Hamlet's cruel misogyny as he basically calls her whore and tells her to get thee to a nunnery. But of course there are complications in Hamlet's motivations, which we'll get into later. She then, though, dies a most lamentable, poetic way as this iconic figure of wasted beauty and innocence. But what if I were to suggest that Ophelia's tragedy isn't so much that woe is her, in that she's the sad victim of circumstance and a scapegoat of emotional manipulation by the men around her, but rather hers is a tragedy of believing that woe is her, i.e. of adopting a woe is me mindset in the first place. So in the rest of this video, I will be explaining how Ophelia illustrates why taking things too personally or positioning ourselves in too passive a role can often be problematic for ourselves. Things which happen to us or which people say to us often aren't really so much about us as it is suggestive of their own anxieties and issues. But if we perceive external events and remarks in too narcissistic a light, we might run the risk of letting others control our narratives, which then, of course, becomes our tragedy. So with that, let's jump straight into my first point. Now, youth is a double-edged sword. It is why Ophelia is so beautiful, but it is also perhaps why she is naive, somewhat myopic, and a little bit narcissistic. When Hamlet spurns her and tells her to get thee to a nunnery, claiming not to love her anymore, she is immediately crippled by her seeming rejection and promptly spirals into wallowing self-pity. But she seems to have forgotten the larger context of Hamlet's political role and constraints, which her brother and father, Laetes and Polonius, have already warned her about in Act 1, Scene 3, as when Laetes says, Perhaps he loves you now, and now no soil nor quartal doth besmirch the virtue of his will, but you must fear his greatness weighed, his will is not his own. For he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself, for on his choice depends on the safety and health of this whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it as he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes withal. Following this warning, Laetes goes on to say that Ophelia would do well to keep herself chaste and virtuous and not to make herself too available to Hamlet's affections because the chariest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. It seems, though, that in Ophelia's cheeky response to Laetes' speech, she addresses only the second part of the speech, casting doubt on her chastity, as she tells her brother to keep his moral hypocrisy in check and not show her the steep and thorny way to heaven while behaving like a libertine treading towards hell. However, Ophelia doesn't really acknowledge the arguably much more important and valid first part of her brother's caution about Hamlet's circumscribed position and agency. Regardless of Laetes' personal animus against Hamlet, 
His view that Hamlet's decisions are business, political, not personal, including whatever decisions he makes in love, is a sensible one, which unfortunately Ophelia is a little bit too green to use her father Polonius' word to understand. By the way, guys, if you find this video helpful so far, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below and subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss out on any of my top grade lit study content going forward. I'd also encourage you to check out my membership program by clicking the join button below if you want exclusive access to members only study content and make special video requests. I'll see you there. Her inability to grasp the complexity of Hamlet's identity and station or to view his situation in the broader political stately context largely explains why she is so quickly wounded by his get thee to a nunnery rejection and insult later in Act 3, Scene 4, as when she laments, Oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown! The courtiers, soldiers, scholars, eye, tongue, sword, the expectancy and rose of the fair state, the glass of fashion and the mould of form, the observed of all observers, quite, quite down. And I, of ladies most deject and wretched, that sucked the honey of his music vows, now see that noble and most sovereign reason, like sweet bells jangled out of tune and harsh, that unmatched form and feature of blown youth, blasted with ecstasy. Oh, woe is me! To have seen what I have seen, see what I see. There's an overarching irony in the visual imagery here. Ophelia says that she now sees that noble and sovereign reason is out of tune and harsh, and that she feels deep sadness to have seen what I have seen, see now what I see. But the truth here is that she lacks the worldly wisdom to truly see the reality of Hamlet's complicated situation. Now, even on a fundamental level, Ophelia cannot see Hamlet for the complex, messy human figure that he is, which necessitates his contradictory emotions and behaviour towards her. As such, Ophelia idolises Hamlet as this noble mind and noble and most sovereign reason. In so doing, however, she puts him on an unrealistic moral pedestal and by seeing her own identity in relation to his standing, she perceives his rejection as a repudiation of her own self-worth, which is why she calls herself I of ladies most deject and wretched, casting herself in an inferior light based on a grossly misguided perception of the prince's true complex self. It is doubly ironic then that she should refer to Hamlet as the expectancy and rose of the fair state, because subconsciously she is aware that at least one dimension of Hamlet's identity is political state. And so he must make decisions or behave in ways that would belie more nuance and complexity that his surface actions might let on. In fact, if we accept the interpretation that Hamlet is aware he is being spied on by Claudius and Polonius in this very encounter, which of course Ophelia knows, then a more sophisticated Ophelia would have had even more cause to pause and consider if Hamlet's hostility towards her in this moment is faked, perhaps to actually protect her from her father's suspicions of them sharing too intimate a bond. Now, not to sound too harsh, because as I've mentioned at the start of our analysis, much of Ophelia's reactions are partly a function of her youth and therefore simply a function of naivete and lack of worldliness of no fault of her own, there's a touch of narcissism in Ophelia's speech, with the histrionic apostrophes of, oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown, oh, woe is me, and indeed the recurrence of first-person reference in, and I, of most of ladies most deject, woe is me, to have seen what I have seen, see what I see, etc. Now, contrary to what seems like the most obvious interpretation here, i.e. Hamlet is humiliating Ophelia and that she's a victim of his misogynistic abuse, we could consider it may just as much be a situation where Ophelia simply doesn't really appreciate the nuance and layeredness of either Hamlet or his broader political context. And as thus, taking his harsh remarks towards her a little bit too personally, believing him to truly have fallen out of love with her and thus letting him cripple her mental state from this point onwards until her suicide. 
And of course, this is all to her own detriment. Now, one of the curious things about Ophelia is how little she actually says compared to all the other characters in the play. And yet she takes on such heavy, dramatic and actually cultural significance. This is partly to do with the emotional intensity she shows and the pathos she evokes in the audience as she comes to embody this figure of a thwarted, castaway maiden who has done nothing to deserve such mistreatment and abuse from the men around her. But another way of understanding Ophelia's significance, despite her limited speech, is to see her not really as a human character, but as a dramatization of art, both performative and visual art. Now, in the latter half of the play, Ophelia actually sings more than she speaks, and at the end, her tragic drowning is described by Queen Gertrude less as a human death and more so as this beautiful painting. In the earlier parts of the play, Ophelia shows a lack of agency and decision-making ability, taking in the words and commands of her brother, father, lover, but never really expressing what she herself wants out of a situation. Even when she reminds Hamlet to make good on his remembrances and sweet words, his swift denial of loving her and his rash insults make her immediately question her initial judgment and belief in his love, as she quickly concedes that, oh, I was the more deceived. This lack of individual agency is consistent with her victimhood mindset, as she is continually cast in a position of someone to whom things happen, rather than someone who actively makes things happen for herself. This is exemplified in Act 4, Scene 5, when Ophelia sings the Bonnie Sweet Robin song while lamenting her father's death. There's fennel for you and columbines. There's rue for you and here's some for me. We may call it Herb Grace on Sundays. Oh, you must wear your rue with a difference. There's Daisy. I would give you some violets, but they withered all when my father died. They say he made a good end. The floral imagery in this moment points overwhelmingly to the ideas of deceit and assembly, because fennel and columbines symbolize flattery, but also adultery. Rue symbolizes sorrow, daisy symbolizes falseness, and whereas violets actually symbolize faithfulness, they have withered all when my father died. So back in early modern England, plants were actually understood to possess both healing and poisoning qualities, depending on how one used them. In Ophelia's case, these flowers are not really herbs for her spirit, but a kind of mental poison which hampers her ability to recover from a broken heart. Ironically, though, there's also a bit of dissembling going on here with Ophelia's speech, because while it seems like she's mourning her father Polonius' death, the underlying theme of her words actually point to romantic melancholy, i.e. Hamlet turning his back on Ophelia's love. That Ophelia would associate herself and her situation with fragile flowers, though, reflects her mental fragility and passive orientation as a beautiful but transient phenomenon that must needs wither, crumbling in the face of external pressures which in Ophelia's case would be the interpersonal complexities and the sort of manipulation of the men around her, which she often doesn't really understand. Ophelia's true vocal agency is compromised here because she's boxed within the role of a performer, a singer, and is as such someone who must express her feelings through an artistic but then also artificial filter, as well as through the lyrics written by others. This means that till the very end, Ophelia is never really given a chance to be her authentic self and is forced to suppress whatever unresolved emotions she harbours towards Hamlet's abandonment, Laetes' control and Polonius' death. However, the pressures of doing so are untenable in the long run, which manifests in the eventual tragedy of her suicide. Indeed, the root of Ophelia's tragedy may be precisely her very helplessness, and this helplessness, woe is me state, is reinforced by Queen Gertrude's poetic eulogy of the girl's drowning in Act 4, Scene 7. First, Gertrude extends on the floral imagery by alluding to Ophelia's final actions as making fantastic garlands of crow flowers, nettles, daisies, long purples, and dead men's fingers, which are wild orchids. Till the end of her life, the girl is associated with this motif of fragile, passive beauty, as these delicate blossoms that must either stand fixed as objects of admiration or be picked at 
for other people's purposes, which is quite an apt parallel for Ophelia's own life. Further, Ophelia is characterized by Gertrude as one incapable of her own distress or like a creature native and endued unto that element. Now, incapable here means being unaware, as in Ophelia doesn't really understand that by immersing herself in water, she is putting herself in mortal danger because perhaps she is like a creature native and endued unto that element, i.e. being in this perilous, helpless, and self-sabotaging environment is Ophelia's default state, her modus operandi. Her default mode, as we've seen throughout the play, is that of a victim who both willingly submits to and is circumstantially forced into positions of disadvantage and danger, often unbeknownst to herself. So we see then that true to Gertrude's framing of Ophelia's drowning, Ophelia's existence is analogous to a beautiful tragic painting in an art gallery as a canvas onto which others throw their brushstrokes and their eyeballs onto, make decisions about and admire passively from a distance, but can never truly understand. And there you have it, guys. Just my quick take on Ophelia's characterization in Hamlet. Now, she may be an unfortunate figure of spurned love and paternalistic control, but perhaps the bigger point of her dramatic function is to show how victimhood is often just as much imposed by others as it is partly enabled by ourselves. So for your next video, I'd recommend that you watch my analysis on Hamlet's What a Piece of Work is a Man's Speech from Act 2, Scene 2, which will give you more insights into Queen Gertrude and her relationship with Hamlet. And you can check that out right here. Click the join button below if you want to be part of my membership program so that you can get personalized essay feedback, make exclusive video requests, and access members-only content. Please hit the thumbs up button below if you found this video helpful in any way. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to my channel so that you can encourage me to help you and other passionate lit learners all around the world by putting out these weekly lit study videos to help you guys level up. And I will see you, as always, in the next one.